Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango, dot org. My fellow sheep, election season is upon us. Are you one of the 12% of Americans who still approves of our government? Then we need your help to force the other 88% into compliance. Our democracy depends on it. We're an organization called Citizens Against Too Much Unfettered Freedom, or CATMUF. CATMUF is a bipartisan flock of sheep whose goal is expanding government until nothing else remains. Because the government is here to help you. How can you help CATMUF help you? By only voting for candidates dedicated to expanding government. It's easy. You don't need to study the issues. No matter what a politician says when running for office, they're all dedicated to expanding government. And make sure you tell all your friends and family to vote for more government. Here at CatMuff, we don't care if you vote Democrat or Republican, as long as you vote for candidates committed to growing our federal family. CatMuff. Because folks just aren't smart enough to handle real freedom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and solpodcast.org. So Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the Bibcot No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bibcot.org. So today I'm delighted to have R.L. Breyer coming in from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, He's an anarcho-capitalist and voluntarist, and you can find his stuff on Pittsburgh Hodler, Pittsburgh uh, Hodler, H-O-D-L-R, uh, on YouTube, Steam it, um, Facebook, and then on Twitter, he's at rbriar23, Briar, B-R-Y-E-R, 23, on Twitter. And we're going to talk about his recent book. Um, it's called Blockchain Project Renaissance, and it basically discusses um, his how he came to blockchain, how he got into it, defining, uh, he defines basic terms, his personal experiences with it, and, uh, and he talks a lot about decentralization and what that's about. So, um, so yeah, we're going to talk about, talk about that to get into what, what's, what's in the book and, uh, you know, how he, how he came to be an anarcho-capitalist. So, um, RL, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Danilo, it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, it's uh yeah, I heard you um you think you messaged me on on Facebook and then you sent me your your conversation with Stephen Clyde, I think it was, right? The Peace and Liberty uh guy. Yeah, I think and, you're right. And uh yeah, it's a great conversation. Really enjoy I really enjoy his co- his podcast as well. Um and so yeah, so I'm like, well, well, let's let's get him on. You know, I I I love supporting people who who like produce content, like either podcasts, YouTubers or authors or whatever, rappers even. Um, documentary filmmakers, you know, people who are enriching the wealth of knowledge. You know, that's, uh, I think that's a beautiful thing. So, uh, so yeah, please let's get into your history. How did you um, come to anarcho-capitalism? Uh, I got into anarcho- anarcho-capitalism when I was uh, studying, still in school at the University of Ohio State. Uh, I, was in, I was getting into politics at that point, and I still thought, you know, politics you know we're indoctrinated that there's this political answer to everything basically and that's how we're going to save the world or how we're going to create a better world but in reality it's just not true but during that point i was uh looking for my you know candidate that i supported and i came across ron paul um and i sort of he sort of led me uh you know into a more uh peaceful you know I, i he's all he was all about peace and prosperity and sound money and that led me to like uh, the austrian school of economics like uh going down that rabbit hole he i think i first heard him talk about like murray rothbard and uh, the mises institute so uh, that led me to uh basically you know the philosophy of anarcho-capitalism and uh free markets 
Yeah, Ron Paul. Yeah, he was a big catalyst for uh, for a lot of people. Um, I mean, not so much for me. I think for me, more with Stefan Molyneux, his his YouTube channel, Lark and Rose, and I don't. I mean, I, I read a couple of Murray Rothbard's um, uh, writings and books, um, like Anatomy of the State, um, uh, Case for the Hundred Percent Gold Dollar, uh, What Has Government Done to Our Money. Um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful writing. The, the way he describes it very clear and crisp and um yeah and then and then other other people influenced me uh, walter block and um and uh, yeah i'm a big hans hoppe fan too yeah i have um i have a few of his books i haven't read them yet though but uh i I think i've heard some of his talks yeah he's a he's a great guy as well so (laughs) yeah after i read uh man economy and state uh with power and market i was like there's no turning back for me (laughs) that was like my conversion so like a lot of people i think you know as soon as you read that it's kind of no turning back At least for me. Actually, yeah. that reminds me of, this, of a meme. I guess more like a cartoon of uh, you know you see a kid in a a kid in a in a bookstore, and mother's like, okay, pick out a book, whichever book you want, and he and he picks up you know some Murray Rothbard book like Man Economy of the State, and then all of a sudden he t- you know, he turns around, and you see the yellow and the black, and he and he, looks, uh, and he yeah. looks at his mother. Taxation is theft. You have no you have no power over me. <laughs> <laughs> i've never seen that one that's awesome i've never seen that <laughs> so yeah it's amazing oh, that's when, funny. when you say there's no turning back like i mean yeah very very rarely is is, is you see the progression you know from anarcho capitalist like back to conservative or back to liberal right you don't, you don't see that right it's a one-way street yeah. most of the time it really is it's like you, you the light bulb goes off and you're just not going to go back so I mean, once you find out, you know, it's the best, it, it, it is, it's the peaceful way to just, you know, uh, cooperate with society, you know, get along with society overall. I mean, right. it's not just, it, economics is everything around us. So right. it's just, uh, it's just the way to go, I think. So, right. Or, or one t-shirt that Adam Kokesh was wearing, uh, I love, which is, um, freedom is the answer. What's the question? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. I mean, I mean, in, in in what case, in what case is initiated aggression or coercion uh, justified? You know, is there ever a situation where that's necessary? And yeah, I would argue no. Um, but so so yeah so um, so that's awesome. Yeah yeah. I mean, um, yeah. It's just I, I find it fascinating how you know to hear different people's uh, different people's journeys. You know, we all we all come from such diverse backgrounds, such different places and you know, and we converge on this philosophy, you know, liberal or uh, or conservative or some people even socialist, you know, background. And, you know, for me my family was heavily Democrat, uh, and my mother would even describe herself as socialist. And so, um uh that you know that that was a sort of a lot of a lot of heated discussions in my household when I was learning about this stuff. And, uh, but then I, you know, became to realize like, like there's no, there's no sense in arguing, you know, it's like once, once you begin to understand this stuff to me, it, it's, it's just about, um, educating the individual, you know, that's why when I tell people what I, what, what my podcast is about, I just say philosophy, economics, and morality, right? That's what I, that's what I teach. That's what I think that's what we all teach, you know? And how could you be against that? Yeah. <laughs> That, that's really what it is too. I mean, just morality, how how to be a moral human being, you know, right. someone who isn't aggressing against other people and, you know, stealing their property and stuff and doing things at the barrel of a gun. So, right. Yeah. And how most people understand what basic morality is. It's just that for some strange reason, the giant exception in their mind is the state, right? Yeah. Everything is subject to the universal laws of morality. Except the state, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it's like that thing where if you put like a uh, list of things that like uh, you w- you would ask somebody, like, you know, uh, could you do this to someone, and they would say no. But mm. if you 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 just uh, put the state in there instead of the, you know a person, it's like it just changes for some reason. I don't understand that. Like the once it's the collective or the majority, mm. it becomes okay. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think that's a great way to explain it to people is is um, to identify crimes that the state perpetrates is basically if an individual does the very same action, is it a crime? <laughs> yeah. You know, and and if if the morality of an action does not change based on the number of people doing it, does it change if you're electing someone to do it for you? 
or it, and then and then they hand that down to their enforcers is that does that change morality no of course not so in, in no in no way do the laws of morality ever actually change it's just that people are blind conveniently blind to that uh, that reality. It's, so it's the, it's the indoctrination from the, the onset of your schooling, you know. Yeah. Schooling. Oh, it's very powerful. Yeah. Very powerful, and, and only the uh, the truly resilient can overcome it and and see through the fog, you know. Um, so yeah, so why? Um, so so let's get into your book. Um, why did you decide to write the book, and what's what it's about? Well, a lot of it is about education. Like I I try to like put my passions together here, and I've always been one of those people that like yourself try to educate people about these things. So. Um, my passion for writing, I I had an English, I have an English degree, so, um, I've always wanted to write a book. So that was one thing that was a key to the, uh, you know, uh, this, and then my passion for economics, freedom, uh, education. I wanted, I I like to, you know, I really like to try to teach these, uh, peaceful, uh, ideas to other people and just, you know, liberty, the liberty mindset and just, owning yourself and you know not having these overlords to other people so and then you know just understanding money is is it should be so elementary but it's not like to me um you know so many people don't understand even the most elementary things about money so uh i think that that those were all like key factors and decisions to do it and then i saw a lot of people last year uh in the blockchain space uh, being taken advantage of, I wouldn't even call it the blockchain space, really, like the BitConnects and stuff that were like fake fake cryptocurrencies. Um, I saw people being taken advantage of there, and I was like, it's time, you know, I have to start doing these these daily vlogs or, um, and then write a book. So uh, it was the daily vlogs, and then I started getting a l- little bit of an audience together, and uh, I was talking to a friend, and he, I was like, hey, if I wrote this book, do you think people would read it? Would you read it? And he said, yeah, I would. So he actually ordered one right there. And I was like, well, I got to write this book now. So I did. <laughs> That's awesome. So, yeah, so let's. So I wrote down a couple of um, a couple of chapters that really fascinated me that I want to get into with you. Um, so the first one is commodity money and fiat. Uh, so what, um, yeah, so please explain those concepts to the uh, to the listeners. Okay, well, historically, commodity money has been like we we sort of talked about this before you and I, like uh, precious metals, like specie, uh, like you know, gold, silver, uh, platinum, things like that. And the opposite or the counter to that would be fiat money, which is what we have today, which is just paper money, money that is created by the state, which is fiat literally means by decree, so it's money by decree. So. Um, yeah, those are the two. It's this dichotomy between uh, real money and paper money, really. So um, today, you know, we've got twenty-one. I think it just passed twenty-one and a half trillion dollar debt in mm. the United States. Right. So uh, this is another. You know, this was like the reason uh, Bitcoin and the blockchain became what it is today. So uh, it's it's a way. Commodity money is a way for us to actually have uh, value. Uh, it, it's it's incentive to uh, save. And produce. So if you if you are holding fiat money, you really don't have any incentive to hold it long term. Uh, it literally gives you uh, an incentive to spend it quickly. So um, if you if you're holding a commodity that you anticipate will um, either hold its value or appreciate over time, then you are more likely to uh, hold it over you know store it. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's all about time preference too, which is, you know, uh, the Austrian, Austrian school of economics gets into, uh, whether you want to hold, you know, uh, spend it now or, uh, hold it for, uh, later, a later time, you know, um, uh, current versus future, uh, you know, spending and production. So I'm trying to do the best I can to explain that. It's a lot to get out in one, like, uh, but yeah, just, uh, uh, the means of you know the, you you're not going to have you're not going to be able to uh, have a very productive society if um, if you don't have a uh, a good money. So I think that's I think that it, Bitcoin and that the entire network of uh, cryptocurrencies a few a uh, few of the best you know will over time be much better and they already are they're proving to be you know more valuable uh, over time. Bitcoin itself is. Uh, uh, gained over a percent a day for its, its entire existence, so I think that's a pretty good store of value so far. Yeah, <clears throat> so this topic of um, 
of money and precious metals and fiat is um, is a wonderful topic I find to discuss with people who have never heard of any of these concepts because it is one of the less polarizing of topics. Like, for example, if you were to get into immigration with someone, that's a very inflammatory uh, <laughs> it's a very inflammatory topic. If you were to get into taxation, another inflammatory topic, right? You know, if you were to get into, I don't know, I don't know, gender, whatever, laws, maybe <laughs> that's a very yeah. inflammatory topic. But what about um, the Federal Reserve? Does the common person have an opinion on the Federal Reserve? They don't care what the Federal Reserve is. Not only that, <laughs> most of them don't even know what it is, right? Yeah. What What's their opinion on fiat currency? They don't care and they don't know. No, <laughs> so it, that's it, why... It, it's- Go ahead, go ahead. It's, yeah, it's ma- sorry, I didn't mean to jump. No, it's okay. There. It's okay. It's amazing that you know we all use money every single yeah, day. Yeah. Like I don't know anyone that's not using money every right, day in right. some regard. Like you're using it whether you know or not to keep the lights on yeah. at the end of the month or whatever yeah. you know, or the beginning of the month, whatever. So it's like, um, yeah, how do you not understand like what fiat is even? You know, it's it's really just brainwashing. Like they've. And then the whole thing is just, it really is amazing that people aren't at least somewhat, you know, educated on the difference between the two. So I'm going to mention three books that really influenced me when talking about money. And the first one is um, G. Edward Griffin, um, uh, Creature from Jekyll Island. That was an amazing book. Learned a lot about history, of Federal Reserve, and uh, yeah, and, and, and how the evolution occurred from commodity money to um, to fiat, right? And, uh, and that, yes, fascinating book. Excellent. Um, and then another one is by Mike Maloney, which is called Rich Dad's Guide to Investing in Precious Metals. Excellent book. Again, talking about history and precious metals and, and, um, uh, and cycles. Um, I think he calls them well cycles. Uh, and, and also what, what, what happens over time as the, as the currency gets manipulated by central banking institutions, uh, what he calls happens is wealth transfer, Right, because um, you know nothing really changes. Like all this, you know, the goods, the physical things are still there. What's different is where is all the wealth? You know, it goes from from uh, real things, and then it gets transferred to fiat by decree, by state decree. But as we know, something that you know, Voltaire said, um, you know, m- uh, money will always uh, revert back to its intrinsic value of zero. <laughs> right. So it it was it was paper and ink before. Uh, you know the state forced it to have value it will re- revert back to zero <laughs> eventually you know because the um mm. you know there there there's the the um uh in, in, in his first i think it's his first uh episode of his documentary series hidden secrets of money uh there's one uh guy said that they they tried to figure out all you know which fiat currencies in history have lasted the test of time which have not died, right? And the guy, he went through all the A's, all the B's and C's, and then he realized, wait a minute, they all died. None of them survived. So they <laughs> yeah, have a th- 100% fatality rate. <laughs> I think the sh- I think the shelf life for uh, like a national fiat currency is like 50 years on average. So yeah. but the idea of, of holding a commodity, and I view the Bitcoin network as like, uh, a commodity in itself, like this, the entire, you know, it, that's the backing for the network. Is yeah. it, it, you know, cri- Bitcoin um, is is a application, the cryptocurrency running on the Bitcoin network. So it's kind of confusing to the newcomer, but mm. um, uh, so uh, in and what what we're what you and I are kind of like trying to bring about here is like Gresham's law is like yeah. good money, uh, exactly. bad money will drive good money out of circulation. So. Yeah. That's what we're seeing with Bitcoin. Is that you know people view it as a good money, so they're still they're they'll hold on to it. It's uh, comparatively better than fiat. And what's amazing about that law is that people um, people act in accordance with that law without even actually knowing what it is. <laughs> 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 you know, it's like, it's yeah. like, it's, go ahead, go ahead. It, it, no, it's, it, that's absolutely correct. They, it's like, uh, innate. It's yeah. just like built into your, your, uh, DNA or something like, you know, you somehow just know that like, this is not really worth anything, even though you like pretend <laughs> right. it is, right? It's human beings responding to incentives. So, so, you know, um, one the most recent example of the United States was, um, when, na- before 1965, the quarters and the half dollars of of U.S. currency, um, I think, yeah, and the dimes also were ninety percent silver. 
before 1965, right? And and then so what ended up happening after 1965, they took out all the silver, but they retained their face value of 10 cents, 25 cents, and 50 cents. People innately immediately understood, or or maybe just word spread like lightning, that that um you know the 90 percent silver coins are worth the same as as the as the, as the regular you know garbage coins. So why spend the 90 percent silver coins when you can use the same, <laughs> the garbage coins yeah. for the same thing? So then immediately people took the 90% coins out of circulation were hoarding them and and one of the uh and, and you know there was a time where you can go to the bank and they would give you people would get like 25 cent uh rolls of 25 cent and 10 cents just for, for that reason but eventually even the bank tellers knew what was going on so they started taking they started snatching the 90% silver and replacing it with the newer quarters <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's you know? people figure it out. This, yeah. that's another thing. Like uh, today, you can't even. There, I don't think. I think you're. It's like illegal to bring certain 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 amounts out of the country. Like if you were just trying to bring a bag of like old coins out of the country, because the melt value mm. is worth more outside of the United States. So yeah. it's it's it should be apparent to everyone, but it's not. You yeah. know, and uh, they they the government obviously knows that. Like Roosevelt when he took us off the gold standard in 1931, like. Right. What did he give people? Like twenty five dollars an ounce or something for their gold, and today uh, it's worth like what? I don't I don't look at the price of gold uh, even every week, but I know it's probably like eleven fifty or twelve fifty, something like in that range normally. So at least recently. So, yeah, yeah. but yeah, it's just interesting that you know um, since since you were talking about the creature from Jekyll Island since nineteen thirteen, the dollar's lost ninety eight ninety nine yeah. percent of its value, and yeah. people just like. I can't figure out why my gallon of milk is five dollars. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, there's a reason for that. It's not just like some greedy businessman. Like, you know, there's factors of production, and uh, they have to still make make money to keep the doors open. And you know, the, the money's not worth anything anymore. So it's not the capitalist's fault. It's the it's the people that are printing endless money or creating, you know, in a, on a computer, just adding zeros to, uh, you know, you can't you can't create. Uh, value doesn't just uh, come out of the ether, you know. Um, there's uh, there's actually, you know, there has to be some. You have to actually produce more pieces in, in uh, commodity goods in in the market, you know. So there has to be more actual production, more consu- more consumer goods to to buy up. So it's just like you can't just uh, add more pieces of paper. Every every country would be obviously just printing money to become wealthy, and well, they try, but it doesn't work. So as yeah. we've seen in Venezuela. Yeah, it's it's such a strange thing, you know, when uh, there's some kind of economic crisis and the government's response is to print p- paper with yeah. pictures on it. It's like, what? How is that going to help anything? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it, I, I don't you know? understand how anybody could buy that, you know? <laughs> but it, really, the majority do, or there would be some sort of, like, revolution to stop it. I don't I don't know. <laughs> I guess that's what the revolution is. You know, this is like like a Bitcoin blo- or a blockchain project renaissance. That's really, you know, the idea of the book. It's like a rebirth, reboot. You know, it's like we have to have a way to... Uh, it, you know, even if we're working just within like our own group of like peaceful anarchist and voluntarist or anarcho capitalist, whatever you want to you know call it, it's uh we can we can work together to be you know be more more productive, more peaceful, and then we will be the captains of industry uh, overall. Like you're already kind of seeing it. Like a lot of there's like a lot of young millionaires and stuff in the blockchain space now that are like they are going to be the people that are your boss. So, <laughs> you know, um, I, I think that's an, that's a good thing. You know, the, the smartest people are, you know, the dorks or whatever are going to be like <laughs> ruling the world. It's like the ultimate, <laughs> you know. The, the ultimate joke, the, the ultimate payback, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, and also, interestingly enough, talking about Gresham's Law is um, the opposite of that is the case if there is no central bank. Like right, it's like imagine there is no coercive institution forcing a people to use a particular money or currency. Um, then Gresham, the reverse Gresham's law would take place, and good money will drive out bad because people would see this money retains value. I'm going to use it, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when there's no, f- <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, people, people, people are like, well, you know, we pay our taxes in fiat. It must be real. Yeah. So you know. <laughs> It, th- things like that you yeah. know they it, it, they it's legal tender or whatever right. you know and then if you even just look at uh, you look at uh bill from um 
1970s or something to now it, uh-huh. now it's just a promissory note before it was like this is a certificate you know that was redeemable for gold or whatever right. i don't remember what the exact you know thing was but now it's just it's a note like it's this is it's basically like an iou right oh yeah so oh yeah oh, oh and that reminds me the third book i didn't even mention was um i think it's called something like um t- toxic currency um yeah something like that toxic currency basically talking about you know um yeah central banking but also i learned a lot about what the everything that's written on a dollar bill or a federal reserve note what is written on it like has a serial number why does it have a serial number right like like products that you buy in the store your laptop has a serial number your car has a serial number why does a dollar bill have a serial number <laughs> because yeah. it's, it's a product of the federal reserve and then, and then it's a note, Federal Reserve note. What's a note? It's like a contract or an IOU, <laughs> yeah. right? Like a promissory <laughs> note. It's a note, yeah. right? Um, and, and, and yeah, it's got like, yeah, so it's so a bunch of other interesting stuff. Uh, and also another thing I wanted to mention is um, when I talk to people about uh, precious metals and inflation, central banking, and, and also people, especially people who clamor for the minimum wage, you know, we need to raise minimum wage $15 because that's living wage. Uh, and then I say, well, in... Think back to 1964 when all the coins were 90% silver. The minimum wage was $1.25, I believe. $1.25, I think, in, in 1964. Now, you, most people would say, that's horrible. That's They should be paid more, right? Yeah. Now, imagine how much is a, do, is a, is a quarter, 90% silver quarter worth today? Uh, about four, it's, it's, $4, around $4, $5. Yeah, I, think. I believe that. I'm yeah, pretty, that makes sense. Yeah. So, so five, five quarters, ninety percent silver, is about twenty dollars or twenty five dollars of modern day currency. Yeah. <laughs> and the minimum wage today, seven fifty. <laughs> yeah, you could, I think. Bro, yeah, it's amazing, isn't that? Amazing? Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's probably actually less, right? So they're actually they're comparatively less today. Right. And the minimum and then the minimum wage is like another thing that really bothers me. People it's that funny. clamor for the minimum wage, it's like all you're doing is pricing like the least skilled people out of jobs to begin. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's, it's not good. It's not a good thing. Like that's another show probably, but. Um. <laughs> it's very un- yeah, it's very counterintuitive because um, they're doing it to help the poor, but in reality, what happens is the poor are the first. To get shafted, mm. right? The and and you're get, seeing that you're ahead, seeing that today with today with the uh, uh, computer or the ordering in like fast food restaurants, like the places in like what was it Seattle that are they implemented or they're doing the the fifteen dollar minimum wage or whatever. Like now there's like a kiosk you're ordering from or whatever the, it's the called. Mi- the machines, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, dude, right, right, you know, right. just, the free market is going to figure this out. You're not going to like force them to do yeah. something that they know is going to sh- close their doors. I mean, right. you have to, they have to be able to be, uh, you know, they have to have, they have to make money. They have to be uh, in the green or no one has a job. Like right. all these laws, they have an effect. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. they don't, these things, these laws don't, uh, just exist in a vacuum like there's there's actual real world consequences to exactly. these things yeah when so. people are ignorant of economics they have this cartoonish idea that businessmen are constantly sitting on a pile of money right. that they're not sharing with their employees <laughs> and if yeah. only the government would force them to share we would all be wealthier <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah I think, I think that's like the they they know the media is and you know the banks and the government they're all like the same class or whatever the same group of people whatever you want to say uh so they have this like agenda to like brainwash people that the capitalist like you said is like smoking big cigars on like <laughs> piles of cash with his, like his hair slicked back and stuff and like being fed grapes all day by like exotic <laughs> women so i just like <laughs> You know, but they don't really. They're they're complaining on their cell phone that you know the capitalists made. Like, <laughs> you think you can create that cell phone? Right, you, exactly. You, you'd spend the rest of your life trying to create that cell phone <laughs> before you ever had it. Yeah, you know, exactly. If, if the division of labor is like the best thing in the world, yeah. we wouldn't have we wouldn't be communicating right now without it. So it's exactly. these, these people are like I don't know where they come. You know, they're being brainwashed in the universities today. They're like mostly like communist indoctrination centers right. today. In my so. right. It's yeah. kind of sad. Yeah, it's weird because they they actually pay to be to be brainwashed. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. Really... I I had a hard time like sitting through that. You know, I'm like sitting there like, no, this that's wrong. That's yeah. wrong. That's wrong. Like, but 
yeah, it was. It's tough to go through that, but I guess uh, at least you you get pretty well versed in like uh, countering these arguments. Yeah. Oh yeah, you <laughs> it, do. It's an expensive uh, education in learning what not to do. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, all right. So let's let's talk about. Let's see. Um, ways to acquire wealth. Okay. How, uh, what, what would you say? Uh, that what you talk about there. Okay, so you have the political means versus the economic means. So today you have like all these people like we're kind of talking about that think the way that wealth is like uh, tax, you know, taxing these people and, be, you know, getting into like government office or working for the government or, you know, the political versus the economic means. And then you have like the captain, captain of industry and like the entrepreneurial people that like create all the jobs and produce all the wealth and then you have like this parasitic class which is which is the political class that like sucks all that wealth up they don't produce anything so um i i view blockchain as a way to um increase the breadth of production and get people like producing again so we have all these people like i said that are uh uh becoming very wealthy or already have become very wealthy in the blockchain space and uh i view them as like the great benefactors like the entrepreneurial people and capitalists is like the benefactors of society. So they'll be the ones in the future and currently are producing like a lot of new jobs. And when you see like uh, government, they don't produce anything. Like I said, they just consume all the wealth that has been produced. So uh, that's, that's kind of what I got into in the book is like uh, all these, you know, people like we said that think that the capitalist is bad. Well, Everything you have is because of the capitalist, in my opinion. So, <laughs> it reminds me of one of my favorite memes: capitalism. You see a you see um a picture of a city with bright lights at night, and it says capitalism. The the ism that funded all other isms for the past what three two thousand years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So, so the way I describe that to people is: there's three ways to interact with people, right? First way is coercion and theft. It's also known as the mafia model. Second way is the economic way. That's trade, right? Voluntary um, <clears throat> voluntary exchange. Both parties benefit. Third way is the inheritance model, right? You gift somebody things. Yeah. Now, which way do you think the government... <laughs> They, they do the mob, model, the mob model every time. Your money. I, I've heard Judge Napolitano uh, describe it like that. I love Judge, Judge Napolitano too. Your money or your life. You know, you only have. You, you're going to give it up, or you're going into a cage. Right. You, you know, you have to do it. It's coercion. You know, so it's really easy to get people to do what you want at the barrel of a gun. But <laughs> is that how we want to live? Is that is it, you know we have an option, right? So if we're really free, uh, opt out stop you know do your best to like not be a part of their system yeah and and one of our biggest challenges as um as anarcho-capitalists as volunteerists is helping people to see the gun in the room see the coercion right because all they see is the welfare state all they see is protection you know police making our streets safe for citizens right that's what they see but they don't see the 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 coercion that underlies that that forms the foundation of all that um and how that's completely not only is it unnecessary but it is counterproductive like you said it's a parasite I, I, you know I, I i i think i like to describe it like mary rothbard says it's a parasite on the neck of the industrious siphoning off the productivity of the industrious right absolutely and they don't and, and it's really not it's I think I heard Hans Hoppe say it like this. I listened to a lot of his lectures recently. I heard him talking about it's an, you know the best way to really say it is it it's a, you want to talk about it as a people want to say it's a protection agency. It's an expropriating protection agency. <laughs> it's a it's a contradiction in terms right. immediately. Like you know I'm give me your money and I'm going to protect you. I mean it really is the mafia model. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's the very onset. You know yeah. so like the state doesn't even exist without robbing robbing everyone right so you know but, it's, but, it's, it's, go ahead sorry and, and then uh you just remind me of another of another meme it's like the three levels of criminal the first level is um is the amateur which is like the common thief you know breaks into your house or holds you up a gunpoint in the, in the dark alleyway right mugs you that's like that's the common that's, that's the amateur second level is the um the expert that's the mafia the, the godfather 
type model, right? They they they, yeah. they, they own a couple of blocks in, in the city. Then you have the third level is the god like god mode. That's the politicians. <laughs> because <laughs> because not only yeah. are they doing the same thing, but they're not only doing it more efficiently, but people actually believe that they are legitimate, that they are necessary for civilization to occur. That without them we would plunge into disorder and chaos. And that's basically that that is the God mode. It's like you need yeah. you need me or else society would fail. <laughs> it is interesting that you meet like a lot of people that claim to be atheists, but they their God is the state. Like yeah. they really are like in my opinion, like that that is their God, you know. So yeah. it just seems like the normally those are the people that at least I've met that like have this uh, appeal to authority, like that that total. Uh, uh, they they really just need that like authority factor. Like obviously, it's like you know the one that always comes up: who will build the roads? Mm. You know, like the people that put the iPhone in your pocket can't build roads. <laughs> you know, like, it's yeah, the, I mean, it's, that's it's just the, like it, an embarrassment. It's it's, it's the flat surfaces. The, the flat surfaces is what confuses them. That's that the, the, they have. They they can do microprocessors. Yeah. They can they, they can do you know advanced touchscreen technology, but the flat asphalt surface yeah. <laughs> that's the stumbling block. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that amazing though? Like, how can you even say that with a straight face? Like, I don't know. You have to be so just programmed to believe, like. <laughs> or the the irony, even better, would be if the person texted you, "Well, how would they build the roads?" <laughs> <laughs> that would be even better. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's good. I like that. <laughs> and they didn't even get the, and they, and they wouldn't even understand, understand the irony, even if you pointed it out. Wait, but, what? I don't even what. <laughs> I don't understand. What do you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know. It's like a concept. So another one that should be so elementary like yeah, yeah. uh privatization i learned i've learned a lot of that stuff from hop uh hans hoppy or hoppa i don't know how you really pronounce his name but like uh, <laughs> all that stuff just you know uh even if you're going to talk about like democracy being like it's really like the worst of the worst yeah uh, if you're going to talk about like political and, and having if you're going to have a government like i'm obviously an anarcho-capitalist like i said but at least under like a, a dictator or like a mon uh, monarch monarch uh monarchical state mm -hmm. um you they have incentive like um hereditary monarchies and stuff right. to um uh, not uh, exploit all the resources immediately like um, mm. so they would you know they have incentive to uh, hold on to those things so they can produce over time and not just blow all their all their resources like democracy is an encouragement for people to come in and just like uh, exploit all the resources as fast as possible because there's term limits right so you know in, the idea of democracy is you know it's mob rule but then you get these people in there that are like our guy's going to exploit all the resources faster than yours. <laughs> <laughs> or I so will rob really you. I will yeah. rob you 2% less than him. Yeah, yeah. But in reality, <laughs> it's just like these guys that are like, well, it, they suffer from libido dominandi. And, then, you know, that's just the lust for power. Like right. all these people, they're just like power hungry. Because, I mean, like look at Trump. Trump, I mean, he had all the money in the world. You know, I mean, and then he he still wants to be president of the United States. It's all a power trip. These people, they, you know, it's not. I mean, maybe not like the senators or uh, congressmen as much, but like uh, I, th I saw something about Nancy Pelosi, and she came into uh, her her position with like a million dollars or less, I think, and now she's got, you know, fifty million dollars or something crazy. I don't know what the figure is, but you know, she's got all this money. It's like, wait, she's been a political servant. Right for that long, like, how does she have all this money? You know, yeah. there's all these backroom deals going on that we don't know about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah, it's it's megalomania. You know, it's it's people who um, you know, it's just like in the Lord of the Rings. You know, nobody nobody can wield the Ring of Power, um, and have a good outcome. Right? There's there's no one. Right? <laughs> you know, it's yeah. n it's not just that power corrupts, but it attracts the corruptible. It's a magnet for the scum of society. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, do you know any of your friends like that are decent, good people, hardworking people? They wake up in the morning. They're like, you know what? I want to control my neighbor. You know, <laughs> I want to force him to do what I wanted. I want to, I want to take his money. <laughs> you know, like who, who, who thinks like that? That's the ultimate minority of people that think like that. You know, sociopath, 
So sociopathy is not a common thing, but it's understandable that they're attracted to um, positions of political power, right? Um, and I don't know why people are surprised <laughs> at that. <laughs> like, like why don't why don't the best people get into positions of power? It doesn't surprise you that these people, you know. Uh, don't bat an eye, you know, dropping bombs on third world countries and, you know, uh, drone bombing people and, mm. you know, just destroying people's lives. Like, it's, it, 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 you, you don't see a pattern there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, like you said, sociopaths are just attracted to that sort of uh, power over other individuals. It's it's really sad that, you know, like people have gone along with it as long as they have. Right. And then that we've been brainwashed in America specifically, and then we've now you know we got to spread our our goodness to <laughs> other nations. Our goodness, so right. yeah, our goodness around the globe. We have to make them democratic as well, you know. So there's like very few countries left that aren't democracies. Like I know we're supposed to be a republic, but uh, you know it's like even that you ask you ask. 10 people on the street what kind of government these United States have and they're going to say a democracy you know they, that, that, reminds, that. that reminds me of a meme it's like uh, I, th I think in memes by the way that's how I think I just think in memes <laughs> of uh, <laughs> like like it's like what's what's stopping us from colonizing Mars and then and then it's like just tell just tell the US government that they, we found oil there they'd be like oh we got a free we got to bring some freedom to Mars <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna get him there <laughs> yeah, that's funny that's funny too <laughs> they need some freedom over there <laughs> yeah i heard they're run, running low on freedom on mars yeah. they're, run, they're running really well we gotta get up there there will be yeah. absolutely no no delay no postponement <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and then you, have, you even have people that like think nasa and stuff creates all the technologies that we use today and it's like no they really don't they 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 hardly create it i don't know if they create anything yeah you know like, <laughs> yeah they've just stolen a lot of wealth you know yeah and uh and, and the other thing is that um when you know innovative and creative people work in the free market, you know, and work for business and how to pro have to prove themselves, have to compete with other people, um, you know, for, you know, with their ingenuity. When those people go into the state and work for the state, you know, maybe in the beginning they're still productive and creative and everything, but that incentive to be better and improve goes down because they no longer have to compete anymore. You know, y y they're no longer in the market. They're, they're working for the state. And so... Yeah, that's that. It, that's why it's it's completely understandable that all of the the best innovation happens um, in private hands. It, it, you know, it, it, when when people are in the marketplace, actually working for private companies, having nothing to do with the state. You know. Yeah, that's why. De that's that's what I got into in the book too. Like why decentralization is so important. Like we have this uh, dichotomy dichotomy outside, which is like the political centralization versus decentralization, status versus um, you know, anarchist or individualist or voluntarist, whatever. But in, you know, and then we in blockchains we have the same thing, which is like why, how I think we can like free up the people that really, you know, we got to get people into the right blockchains, like decentralized blockchains, where we're going to be able to like a you know produce again, to where the good people have a place to go to really create, mm. like even art and stuff today is like, you know, none of the great. Nothing great. The theory of relativity wasn't done by state dictate and mm -hmm. stuff like that. You know right. things like that. Right. You know, right. so like you said, you know, there want you have to have competition. And with and you, as soon as you go into the state, you just become like this lazy. Like, um, it's another thing. Like you want to talk about like law and stuff. You know, in all the government, it, you know, it's all positive law. You have all these people. Like we need like private law society where these people you know, the best people where, you know, we have people that are already like pillars of their community, like making these sort of judgments, not people that are like wanting to, like we've talked about, just roll over people mm -hmm. with bad judgments, you know, and like throw innocent people in cages and things like that, you know. So I think it all like ties in together. Like we got to like make sure that we use like just decentralized, you know what I mean? I think that's so important today. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, so let's talk about this chapter that it's called savings versus consumption. So, so what did you get into in there? 
Yeah, this is that's just another sort of like thing about like the production. Just get making sure that we like have a reason to save. You know, if we're consuming all of our uh, everything we we produce, then where are we? What what kind of future do we have? You know, so that's another thing. Like the Keynesians think that you can just uh, consume. It's they 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 pre- they uh, preach consume 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 and that's why they feel like just printing money is a good thing because they will get you to spend it if you feel like you have wealth <laughs> but if, you know what i mean <laughs> but if it doesn't have any value but we need savings you know a lot of people don't have any savings today in america so um we need incentive to save though so if, if we're if people are buying specie or they're buying cryptocurrencies they actually have a, a valid reason to save you know, right so right it's all about like time preference and right uh, you know, holding on to your holding on to your you know, the fruits of your labor. Like you don't have to go blow your money every week. You know, save. But do you? I mean, what what's the incentive to save if you know that it's losing money holding it? So um, being able to put your money into things that like commodities, commodity money, which I view the blockchain and precious metals. They're but you know alike. Uh, I think you know if you're in a good project in blockchain that. It's definitely a reason to hold on to your money and not go blow it every week like a lot of people in America do. Yeah, yeah. It, the um, the incentive um, for spending your money is or your currency is definitely understandable given our inflationary environment, right? Um, like you, you can see this is very apparent, uh, very in your face when you look at uh, countries who are undergoing hyperinflation like Venezuela right now or even... Um, um, you know, Weimar Republic, Germany, you know, so many mm-hmm. different examples, uh, Zimbabwe. And basically the people like, you know, most people understand like right now, people, when they work, they get paid weekly or biweekly, right? That's understandable. But in a situation of a hyperinflation, people cannot wait even a week because the value of their currency will depreciate so much that they're going to lose all that purchasing power. They want to get paid every day. And so right when yeah. they get paid, it's like a hot potato. They want to get rid of it, you know. I gotta get rid of my money. They gotta get rid of it, you know. And <laughs> yeah. and so it's understandable. It's you know, it's just um, <clears throat> just humans responding to what's going on in their environment, right? So what's the what's the solution? You know, we want to put our the fruits of our of our labor into a storage facility that does not depreciate at all, that actually appreciates, right? And so that's where precious metals and you know cryptocurrency comes in is that um, these are these are mediums of holding wealth that are not you know governed by the state or not state decreed and so you know people flock to them because of their value for storing wealth right and that's why precious metals have been used for thousands of years not because the state forced people to use them but because people found them to be useful for trade and for holding uh storing value right um <clears throat> and one thing i was um you know to illustrate um illustrate the idea of uh, of of fiat currency and how worthless it is <laughs> i like to tell people this i used to tell people this uh when i worked in my acupuncture clinic um i said a one dollar bill to store, transport, like to print, store, and transport, costs about six cents. <laughs> a one dollar bill, right? Paper and yeah. ink, paper and ink, right? That's it. Yeah. A hundred dollar bill. I asked them the same thing. How much do you think <laughs> that costs to store, yeah. transport, and print? Seven cents. You know why? Because it's got two extra zeros, so they got to use more ink. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that, I mean, dude, that's like the best way right there to explain that to someone. And when I right? tell them that, their eyes widen in shock. They're like, "What? This is what I've been busting my butt for." <laughs> yeah, that's what. That's why. That's why we have to stop trusting these people that, that are creating the money and put our trust into math and algorithms. <laughs> You know, yeah. like uh, we don't need to trust people anymore with our money. We have we have uh, we have back. We have we have blockchain. We have, uh, uh, you know, we have cryptocurrencies that run on blockchains that are um, based on math. You know, so mm. um, we really, you know, we don't need people anymore to, to coin to coin yeah. our money. You yeah. know, yeah. 
and, and like you said earlier, it's kind of funny because that 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 example you gave about like debasing like uh, the metals and stuff and like putting less and less into them. Like today, you pick one up and it's like. I can't believe how light some of these coins are. Right. They're like right. plastic. Right. And, uh, <laughs> plastic. Back, I think that they really feel like, to me, they're like completely weightless. <laughs> so, so you go back to like, I think it's like the Roman Empire even. Um, they, they that, That's what they did back then. They uh, That's how the ridges on the coins began, I think. Right. They're like picking them off, like taking little pieces of the value away. Yeah. Whatever those indentations are called. Yeah. I don't really remember. But yeah, so it's just like, this is this is... This is history, you know. This mm-hmm. is another problem with like American institutions and just school schooling, which is I think in Germ it came from the German the Prussian Empire. Yeah, you know, they've schooled people to not understand this stuff, you know. So uh, just I lost where I was going with that, but just go just the entire uh, the entire like uh, system has been like created to like confuse us and like just give us this um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for like uh trust just the trust you know this like um i'm trying to think of the best way to put this like just it's like hubris almost like just like believing in people these people that are like just oh i can be uneducated about it you know it's not gonna hurt me but uh it is (laughs) you know whether you know it or not like it is hurting you you know yeah so um all right so now let me ask you before we uh sign off um what so given that you wrote a book on um blockchain technology and uh, cryptocurrency um what is your perspective on on cryptocurrency versus precious metals because i already know your perspective uh, about fiat so cryptocurrency versus precious metals how do you um how do you rate the two and do you classify one as more important than the other so what's your view on this uh that's a good question like i i still think uh specie is you know precious metals are going to be like important like you said earlier those have been money for millennia Mm. so it's not just going to go away Mm -hmm. i think that's i think it'd be good to like hold both Mm. so if you're talking about like trying to preserve your wealth i wouldn't put all your eggs in one basket right uh, I'm not a financial advisor. But that's the, <laughs> disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, disclaimer. I am not a financial advisor. But that's how I. That's the way I view it. Like, if, especially for people that hold like a substantial or decent amount of wealth. But even the people that don't, and they're trying to get there. Like, you know, this is like what I'm talking about in the book. You have to like begin somewhere. So there's got to be a way to store. Your, you know, start to save. Mm-hmm. So uh, I view them both as very, very important. Uh, the less fiat you can hold, the less paper, you know, debt money. Yeah. It's based on debt. Uh, it's printed out of debt. So even the money from the onset is it's debt. You know, I mean, um, I think that's why you can never. We can never be like we got to get somebody in there to lower the deficit and start paying back this debt. Well, you can't pay it back. It's created out of debt. Mm, you know, so yeah. you're never going to be able to pay it back. It's literally created out of debt. So. Um, yeah, so I think holding both those would be like the best best way. I think I do think though uh over the next like 15 years we're going to see I hope we can go back to this in 15 years and I'm right. <laughs> uh, I think you're going to see like people really pouring into blockchain. I think it's going to be like as important as the internet mm. or uh, I really think it it'll be like more important than the internet because right. we're we have internet's, you know, that are on the blockchain. So um you know that's another way we're going to be able to privatize everything so um i think that they'll both be very important but as an asset class i think cryptocurrencies will be like there's going to be all of these people that um they they become very very wealthy like these you know the ones that are in the right cryptocurrencies because i'm not going to say you have to do your homework i get into that in the book too you can't just like uh, throw your money like darts at a you know or you know at a dartboard. You got to get into the right ones. So I like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, EOS. Um, those are the big ones for me. Bitcoin Cash. I'm starting to become a believer in. So uh, I don't know. It's like you have to be in one or the other in that community, Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash. But I think they're both like they both have utility right now. So I just think that those those over time will be like. Uh, they'll be like gold silver platinum whatever mm. they'll be like those will be like the new thing but like holding the ones that have been money for millennia are you know it's just you can't have a more safe bet than that mm. you know what i mean like yeah. so 
it's 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 those are those are very they're both important i don't i don't really have a uh I don't have anything against uh, the old the old money. Yeah. So so talking about um, uh, you mentioned yeah uh, people pouring into blockchain. Uh, the first thing I thought of was I think that's true, uh, and I, but I think that the major stumbling block, but it's I think it's being overcome now, is making blockchain and cryptocurrency user friendly, like mm-hmm. like just as easy as you know going to the store and. And with your dollar bills and buying, you know, eggs, just as easy as that. People need to understand how to go to the store and buy with with Bitcoin, right? So once it gets to that level of comfort, of intuit, like like that, your grandmother could understand it, then everyone's going to adopt it because um, it's so much faster, so much easier, and um, and also it appreciates. <laughs> mm-hmm. It doesn't that's lose value, be- you know. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. It's like open source, so like some like genius. 14 year old kid could be in his bedroom right now creating like an app where you know we're yeah. going to use that uh there, it's called dapps decentralized applications so mm. we're like this kid could be in his bedroom like i said working coding mm. uh, some application uh you know in on one of these blockchains it's like going to change the world and, you know yeah. uh, I, I i've said i think it's going to be like important in like cars even like today a lot of cars are hackable i think that there'll be a blockchain you know uh solution to that i think mm. that'll happen really fast if somebody gets on that i want a little bit of that but <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think that'll be important like yeah. there's i think it's going to be used in like so many different ways yeah. and then, but you know i just don't want to see it co-opted like i don't want to see the centralized uh, institutions and stuff come in like ripple is like the banker block blockchain it's really not even a blockchain really so i don't want to see all these people come in and like um co-opt it you know what i mean it's mm. important for people to get into the decentralized projects yeah yeah the um so so i also thought of um mike maloney and um, goldsilver.com he has this hidden secrets of money documentary series and one of the episodes i think it's eight he talks about german the german hyperinflation and he visited the german central bank uh and he saw there's like a museum there and he saw the printing press that, that printed all the money right at that time and and he was saying he's like just look look at this thing you know M- uh, papers going through it combined with ink and they're just printing the stuff that the politicians are just printing the stuff laughing all the way to the bank <laughs> they're just printing, printing yeah. you know and and of course they give you know some of it to their friends and you know enrich themselves and all that um, but that's how easy it is to create money, right? That's before all internet and digital stuff. Um, but how easy is it to create precious metals, gold and silver? And I asked my, I asked my, my patients this, how do you think gold and silver is made? Nobody knows, right? So there's two ways that Mike Maloney says that gold and silver can be made or precious metals in general is the collision of two neutron stars or a supernova, <laughs> <laughs> now, now, how yeah. well do you think the state can control those events? <laughs> yeah, well, they probably tell you they they, they can do it. <laughs> so that's like, why that's why I love precious metals because yeah. it's it's here. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> you can't destroy it. Doesn't rot. Doesn't wither away. You know, you drop a bar of gold to the bottom of the sea come back in a hundred years it's still there do the same thing with paper within a couple days maybe a week it's all disintegrated (laughs) already (laughs) so they both have uh pros and cons like the one thing i would say is like it's nice in like the crypto space cryptocurrency spaces that you could like you're able to take your entire wealth across the oh, yeah. border. Oh, definitely. Example, oh, I love that. Holding on to it. You oh, know yeah, what I mean? that's great. That's yeah, that's one of the biggest advantages of it is transferring value over long distances instantaneously. Instant- right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah that's right. the beauty of it. Like oh, yeah. they but like you said like uh you can't for you if you had your phone, you had your wallet on your phone and you didn't have it backed up, you couldn't throw it into the ocean like you could a gold bar. So right. they all have pros and cons. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. definitely. But except right. fiat, it's just garbage. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's or, or literally as, uh, trash. Or as uh, Robert Kiyosaki, you're familiar with Robert Kiyosaki, the, he's a right, the, the author of uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, the, the original series. Um, he basically he te- teams up with Mike Maloney, has some YouTube videos, and he, he, calls, uh, he calls fiat money uh um toilet paper trash he's like (laughs) and one of his best quotes i love cash is trash (laughs) (laughs) 
I love it. It really <laughs> is. It, 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 just to circle back real fast, we were talking about Venezuela earlier, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and we've talked about the Weimar Republic and how they did they debased the currency and started printing like crazy. Yeah, that happened in Venezuela, and they are using Dash down there. Like that's yeah, become oh, yeah. like a huge thing. Have you seen that documentary yet? They, somebody put out. I forget the guy's name. Yeah, I did hear about that. That they're really going towards cryptocurrency. Yeah, yeah. I did hear about so that. So we're seeing like. I, that you know, I, I think it's like just as important in first, you know, uh, industrious nations, mm. uh, uh, cryptocurrency, but in the places where you know a lot of people don't even have access to bank accounts, or they charge you, they they charge the poorest countries in the world the highest rate mm. to send a wire transfer, or, you know, <laughs> things like that. Right. You know, it's just like completely upside down. Like yeah. they're really just like trying to keep these people down. So, right. it, you know, you have a smartphone, you can send your cryptocurrency. And now you can buy a bag of grain and now you can produce a, mm. uh, a farm yeah. for the people around you. And then you, you lift yourself up. So right, right. I think that's like huge. You're going to be huge. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, wonderful conversation, RL. Um, so before we go, I always ask my guests, what is your favorite quote of all time? Oh, man. <laughs> my favorite quote of all time. Oh, dude, you just stumped me on that. I wasn't ready for that one. I know. Uh, I, I pop it on everyone when they come. <laughs> my favorite quote of all time. Uh, how about something? <laughs> I was just going to say something. I'd say something. Well, like yeah, that's fine. It could be something. De- that you well, can I keep it to one word? One word? Decentralized. <laughs> Decentral- all right. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. De- decentralized. Uh, yeah, let's just say that. All right. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I mean, as, as Jeff Burke says, you know, we, we're not necessarily <clears throat> against, um, government. All we want is decentralization. So we want, instead of just, you know, what is it like 270 nation states or governments, we want 8 billion governments. <laughs> everybody, yeah. everybody is their own government. <laughs> they're yeah, self, I mean, they're a self government. They self govern themselves, right? Every household is their own government, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, or you can also say, um, um, in relation to your neighbor, you are an anarchist, but in relation to yourself, you're a monarchy, right? You are a master of yourself, but you're an anarchist toward your neighbor, <laughs> which is I a, like that. Yeah. It's an interesting way of, of looking at it as well. <clears throat> so, yeah, wonderful conversation. Um, RL, so Had a good time. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So if any, uh, you know, please, um, well, you know, before we go, please, um reiterate the ways that people can contact you if they want to find out more and get your book okay uh twitter at rbryer23 you can dm me uh b-r-b-r-y-e-r-2-3 if you want to get a hold of me get a copy of the book that way i'm on steam it uh at pittsburgh hodler one word uh also let's see here uh also on gmail if you want to just order one through my email at pittsburgh hodler or uh, pittsburgh hodler at gmail so pittsburgh h-o-d-l-r at gmail and we'll, we'll set up a way to get you the book yeah yeah check out the book um check out all of this uh stuff youtube steam it facebook twitter i think he's doing great work um and looking forward to the second book because you know we need more um content creators you know the more content creators the better it's just increasing the wealth of information you know increasing um increasing the knowledge in society and it's never never is a bad thing you know you want to you, you know we don't we don't suppress we, we don't defeat bad ideas by suppression we defeat bad ideas with good ideas <laughs> with yeah good, with good arguments right yeah right. it's like that idea you know idea that t-shirt we've been talking about memes and stuff ideas so good they they uh must be mandatory that's the state <laughs> the state salute the state idea yeah <laughs> so we don't need that we need we need cooperation voluntarily right yeah, yeah. good ideas don't require force you know it's like uh that's just, that's just it so yeah yeah wonderful talking to you um rl so yeah please people check him out he's doing some good stuff so thank you for listening this is peaceful anarchism on the voluntary virtues network on the conscious resistance.com and solpodcast.org wishing all of you have a wonderful day take care bye thank you for listening if you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it Please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. 
If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.